So it's been, uh, I don't know, about a week, a week and a half. I, what have you been doing in the last, uh, I don't know, 10 days or so? Uh, yeah. Uh, we, as I've said before, we, we wear many hats um, being a small team, but um, it's been a lot of lingua franca going on lately, which has been really cool. So um, our multilingual formatting and passing library, uh, which is the thing that, allows Mycroft to understand and express natural language. Um, that's been getting a really big refactor um, from Chance Encounter, um, one of our other community contributors. Contributors, And uh, yeah, it's it's a huge, huge refactor, but it's, it's going to be a really solid um, basis for future editions of new languages and, and the ability to kind of add, add languages incrementally and stuff. So... So yeah, there's been a fair bit of work on that, which is really cool. What have you what been doing yourself? for fun? For fun? Oh. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any we, uh, side projects or anything like that? Like, I have a one-year-old. We don't have fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> ha. I have two kids, and I still manage to uh, squeak away some time for stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, um, what have we been doing for fun? I mean, we're, we're painting. We're doing some painting, like. Uh, doing some feature walls in the house is that fun is that I home renovation do, do you find that fun some people like that stuff it's pretty bright and it's pretty fun like as in visually fun so yeah, yeah if it adds value to your life then i i'd count that as a win yeah 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 um yeah i mean it's it's pretty hot it's pretty pretty brutally hot here at the moment so we it stays like 32 degrees celsius um which is i don't know like 100 or something for all the americans um but the humidity is just brutal at this <laughs> time of year so uh still get out for rides and things like that but uh yeah it's it's just it's just hot <laughs> it's minus four and it snowed here today <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so you mentioned Fahrenheit for your for the uh, for the Americans. So I'm in the process of submitting another um, series of articles to OpenSource.com, and they changed one of my Celsius to Fahrenheit, and so I kicked it back to them, and I was like, "That's not really fair because most of the world uses Celsius. Uh, not to mention, yeah. like, I also writ wrote it as Celsius. Uh, so we'll see what they do with that. I just thought that was." Uh, it's interesting how we as we as people become um, our worldview is is so much focused right around what's next door, and so we just automatically mm. view things as like, well, everybody else will see it exactly like me and my neighbors see things, and yeah. uh, I'm I'm guilty of that too. I just think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when in actual fact, three hundred million people out of a total of billions, up to like seven billion. Yeah, yeah. yeah use fahrenheit so yeah um what about you though what have you been up to yeah that's a good question um so i bought a game called graveyard keeper and i've kind of been enjoying playing that it's kind of like um it's a little bit like stardew valley it makes you have uh kind of morally questionable ideas or like choices so you you get hit like the the opening scene is you get hit by a car and then you're transported to this other world and um, you have to take the place of what's called the gravekeeper. And so people just come by your land and just like dump off bodies and um, you have to like you, you bury them and stuff like that. But you can also do things like um, perform autopsies and keep the heart and the head and the brains and like whatever, all of these other kind of things. And uh, it's kind of interesting. So it's I've been kind of playing around with that and uh Aside from that, I had a weekend project where I decided I was going to go and get all of my data out of Garmin. So I have like a Garmin watch for the running that I do. Mm. And uh, it turns out those guys are a bunch of bastards. Uh, they use oh, true. three different types of date formatting. Um, and it, yeah. <laughs> so like you get you extract your heart format and it's using seconds <laughs> since the epoch. And you get uh, like another one and it's an actual date format and you get a third one and it's like, it's, I don't even know how they calculated it, but when I ran it, so I'm using Python and when I ran it through Python, it's like 
four hours behind me. So it's I'm GMT minus four. And so my immediate thought was like, oh, well, they did the math wrong. And then I was like, wait a second. If it's four hours behind me, then the timestamp is GMT minus eight in this data for reasons. I don't even know what what uh, it's like Hawaii or something. I don't know what time yeah. time zone that's in. So I spent the weekend kind of untangling the data and then dumping it into my local influx DB so that I could uh, have all of this historical data. Because uh, part of what dri drove this, other than the fact that I, I like to control things, is so many of these uh, companies are shutting down things as a, like they're using this COVID situation as reasons to pull back or dump data or, or whatever. Like um, smart Samsung has abandoned their smart things hub which is kind of related to what we're talking about here with, with the whole IOT thing. So when I, when I ran into that, I was like, Oh man, I have a lot of running data in there that I'd kind of like to keep, like it's useful for me to give to my doctor. Cause like resting heart rate and like all of these kind of metrics that I've had in the last couple of years. So yeah, I spent the weekend, uh, untangling and rewriting, uh, dates and yeah, basically I threw the, the thing up on GitHub. So if anybody's looking for, an example of how to use Python to get your data out of Garmin into InfluxDB. I kind of tossed one up mm -hmm. on my GitHub. I think we covered a lot in our last video about, you know, getting set up with, with Mycroft and setting up a virtual environment so that you could work with a different type of Python if you needed to and how you install skills. And from this, we, we kind of realized that in order to, to have a good base, that we should cover a lot of the required skills for getting involved in the Mycroft community in general. As yeah. part of that, I think we, we kind of agreed that we should take a look at Git. And part of this was accidental. You know, we, in the last video, we found that Home Assistant, the Home Assistant for Mycroft was not populating in the Mycroft web UI. And so, we decided that we were going to sit down and try and investigate what was happening there. And so, yeah, I think we, we hit some bugs and, um, as I guess, good contributors, we decided that we weren't going to ignore those bugs completely. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, we were going to go ahead and try and fix them. So I think what we're going to do today is, dive a little bit more into how, you know, how are we going to fix these things as we come across them? Um, we're, I think we're going to do a more in-depth dive into making a good pull request and stuff like that. But I think for today, we're, we're really just going to focus on um, getting the minimum viable information out there about we've got a problem with Git. How do we communicate this in a reasonable way like you've got two active contributors here we've got uh gaz who is obviously from mycroft so he's kind of overseeing what's happening so part of what we're doing is you know we're going to be troubleshooting and hacking our way around and we want to kind of refine that but we thought there was value in in showing us kind of fumbling around through the dark as we fix this uh problem we encounter yeah yeah and i think it's a really good example of uh you know, if you if you're doing any development, it's it's really important to to know the state of the system before you start. So, you know, we uh, we wanted to to start getting into things, and and we said, look, let's um let's just make sure that the existing tests and and everything's working before we do, uh, and then you know discovered that there's actually a, a few things that we needed to fix up before we could really get started on the things that we were wanting to to um to work on. And so uh, if we hadn't done that, then we probably would have thought that we'd broken something when in actual fact, there was something that was broken before we started. So um, yeah, it's, it's the classic, you know, always try the door handle before trying to pick the lock. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the scenario. yeah. Is the door open? Yeah. yeah. So I think um, for those of you that are already well acquainted with Git, there's still some value in in watching us kind of work through the issues, especially because um, Gez was helping troubleshoot, and it turned out to be a couple of really uh, small issues. But it took us a while to figure out what was actually blocking us there, and so 
um, you know, we, we did our best to condense this down, but there's still some value in, and at least the troubleshooting process, even if you're not really interested in, uh, some of the stuff that we cover, like creating a fork or, um, how to update a branch or how to do rebasing or any of that kind of stuff. Like if all of this is basic for you, you know, um, go ahead and skip past this video, but there might be some good troubleshooting stuff in there for everybody. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is yeah. we're going to add yeah. your fork as another remote on our local system. So um, you can either manually type it or what you need is the, the URL for your, for your fork, which should be, unless you change it, it's going to be the same thing just with a different username in that, you know, github.com slash stratus. Uh, and what we're going to do, uh, so we're already in the skill directory. Um, and if we jump back to the start of the line, we're going to say git uh, remote add and then a name for the remote. So I would say like gez for mine or, you know, yeah. Um, and then the URL. And so we hit, if we hit enter, um, and then we can type git remote, and that will give us a list of the remote repositories that are connected to our local um, repository. Uh, so what happens is, you know, when you're making changes locally, it's actually a completely separate repository. And then we sync that, we push and pull with our remote repositories. Um, but you can actually, yeah, operate the, the local repository is actually separate from all of those from all of those remotes. Uh, so we can also say like git branch um, will give us a list of our branches that we have available on the local um, on the local machine. And you can see at the moment we've got 2008. We've got our feature. Oh, I'm pointing to my screen, which no one else can see. Uh, we've got 2008. We've got the feature common IIT, and then we have a whole bunch of branches on the remotes slash origin. So they're all on the origin remote, which the origin is always um, by default points to the to the remote repository that you first cloned from. And so in, in our case, now it's going to be the, the Mycroft repository, Mycroft AI slash uh, home assistant or whatever it's called, slash Mycroft dash home assistant. Um, but we don't have any branches from our fork, um, from the Stratus fork. So we want to do a git, uh, git fetch, and then the name of the remote that we want to fetch from. And you can see it's now created a bunch of new branches. And if we rerun git branch, it should uh, give us a a few more a few more hits that we can we can choose from. We we'll want to we'll want to check out the 2008 branch. Um, um, so you can also say git checkout dash dash track origin slash 2008. And it will that tells it I want every time I reference 2008, the 2008 branch, I want it from the origin remote. Uh, yeah, so if we hit enter there, um, what it's saying is that we have local changes. Um, that we haven't we haven't applied, um, so we can we can stash those for the moment, um, which essentially says we don't want to commit these, but we want to like we just want to put them to the side for one moment, and then we can we can get them back later, uh, and then we can get check out twenty oh eight again. Cool, and it's it's showing, yeah. Look, it's it's also saying that we are tracking the origin 2008 branch and that we're behind. So yeah, we can, uh, get pull. I normally do Shouldn't dash R. Uh, I just do it out of habit, right? Because I'm, okay. Um, what, what's the dash R again for rebase? Oh, so, okay. Right. Okay. You should, you shouldn't need it, but no, I just do it out of habit because of the times that you do, and it doesn't really hurt anything to do it otherwise. So it just, yeah, fair call. It, it's kind of like um, tacking on a dash V. Like, yeah, most of the time you don't need to have the verbose. I just do mm. that habit. Sure. 
All right, so our local 2008 branch is now fully up to date. Uh, and we want to push that up to our fork. Uh, space Stratus, the, the name of our fork, uh, the name of our remote, sorry. Um, and then I'm fairly sure it's space and then the branch name. Let's try that. So after I straightened around the fact that I have two-factor authentication and I needed a token to do this, we're now logged in. Wonderful. Um, so we've pushed that branch up to our up to your fork, uh, and so we should be able to go to your the to your fork in your browser, um, and that will will show that there's a new branch there. Right there. Um, and so if we wanted to, we could then set the default branch um, to 2008, or we could set the, the default branch to feature common IoT. Um, uh, the benefit of doing that sort of thing is is that you know when you create new pull requests and stuff, it's, it's going to go to that branch by default. Um, and it's also going to be the branch that shows when people visit your, your repository. Um, so, Great. So yeah. we've pushed the branch up. Uh, so if we select the 11 branches just next to that drop down, that should show us a list of all the branches in our repository. Uh, and we can see that there's now the 2008 branch, which was updated two hours ago. Uh, and we should be able to, ah, on the default branch, we can select change default branch right up the top. We're gonna we make could it set it to 2008 to, to match the Mycroft repo, but yeah, I think in this case, we, we probably want to go there. Yeah, it's the purpose driven. So I want to, because we are, that's the purpose of this branch, I think we're going to make this guy the default. Yeah. Um, great. All right. Well, let's jump back to our local terminal. Um, and we'll switch back over to the common IoT branch. Um, and before, we stashed some changes um, that were good changes that we want to keep, right? Yep. So we can get those back by saying git stash pop. So that says bring back the, the things that I stashed. Um, and if we do a git diff, we can see uh, exactly what has changed in our local skill compared to our remote skill. We still haven't gotten the, the settings to show in the... In the web UI, nope. In the web UI, right? Nope, that's what we were working on, so... Hmm. We suspected that it was related to the Booleans. Ah, oh, there we go. Whatever. Oh, I did that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It shows up there now. Good. Yeah. That means I don't have to go dig out my token again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and that's a good example where, you know, it's it's now taken away that second tab because it doesn't see a it doesn't see any devices with a different settings block. In that case then, we probably want to we probably want to push those changes um I really want to make a pull request and push those changes back up to the to the upstream branch. Um, uh, sorry, to the upstream remote to the Mycroft project, um, because if anyone else is is wanting to check out the common IoT feature branch, then they're going to run into the same problem. So, um, but yeah, so if we just do git commit. The length of these lines is also quite useful because it shows how much people are going to be able to see in certain things, in certain interfaces. The first line, though, will get used as the as the short message. So, and I want to say, um, 
I was looking at the micro, like the skill settings that we're mm -hmm. referencing. Cool. Yeah, when we went to the web UI, they weren't there, and so that's where we tracked back what what that is. So when we went there, all we saw was VM, but we didn't see the text boxes that we should be able to fill in for that VM uh, device. Mm. I'm overly cool. verbose with most of the things. If if you read my uh, my variables, my variables will tell you exactly what it is that they're doing because I, RAM is I'm cheap. I'm a very big fan of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't done that. And normally I... That makes sense, though, because it, it knows what branch you're on, so it's just going to push that up to that fork. Yeah. So now if we go back to our web UI, we'll be able to see that commit in... There we go. Six minutes ago. And so, see, see what I mean by, like, when we look at the, the at top line just above mm -hmm. the file structure, um, and, and in there, we could, like, it gives a very quick idea of what the last change was, but we can't see the rest of that commit message. So, um, it's just helpful to make sure that first 80 characters is, is very descriptive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, try to avoid putting something like updated branch because that doesn't help anybody. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think we probably want to push this back to the, to the, um, to the main Project. Microsoft project as well. Yeah. So, well, I, I think we'll, let's do a pull request. So we've pushed it up to our um, to our fork. So we're going to create a pull request because um, we can see that we're one commit ahead of Mycroft feature common IoT. And so just to the right a little bit is a pull request button. Yeah. So if we hit that, it's going to, yeah. And at the top, just quickly, at the top, it shows what the base repository is. So the base repository is the, the repo that you're pushing to, the base branch. So it's the, the branch of that repository that you're pushing to. Um, and then the other side of that um, is is where it's coming from. So it's good to just double check this because, you know, we want to make sure that we're, say, if we're trying to update a skill, that we're updating the latest um, branch of that skill. So if we, if we push it to, say, 2002, then um, it's, it's not going to be in the latest branch and then we're going to have to um, to rebase it later on. So, um, so but that, gonna... that's where we want to push it. So that's great. And you can see there's a little uh, visual indicator arrow between the two, letting you know which direction the, the pull request is flowing. Yeah. And it just means like if you change that base branch to something else, like the 2008 branch, for example, um, it will, it will, go around and check and you can see there it'll say it's got a big red x and say can't automatically merge and that's because so we're, we're going to switch back um to to the branch that we actually want to push towards so beautiful going to create that pull request and we're going to remove this because this is not yeah applicable for to everybody yeah um, yeah, and you can see that it's pulled in the commit message uh, automatically. Um, and if there's multiple commits, it, it should uh, put all of those one after the other um, automatically. So you, you can also, you know, grab those commit messages and turn that into your description. Um, as long as, of course, this actually is meaningful to the description of the, the PR. Right. It's yep. nice. It's nice to be able to have something like this, where it's it's more than a commit message, where it's telling you um, why you're fixing it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a really good tip for commit messages and pull request descriptions. Um, you know, people can look at what are, what the changes in the code are. You know, like. Uh, you know, you you often get commit messages that are like update init.py um, or update readme. And it's like, well, yeah, I can see that you've updated that file. Like that's the file that has been changed in the 
in the commit or in the pull request, why did you change that file? Like, what, you know, was there a bug? Was there, are you just refactoring? Are you, you know, improving code readability? Are you, um, you know, fi fixing a, a particular error that got thrown? You know, um, why why we're making the change really is, is the most important thing. Whew. Wow. Uh, so I sure learned a lot in this video. Uh, we did a bunch of Git stuff. So I have I was kind of, I don't know, Git savvy is not exactly the right word, but I wasn't a Git Luddite before we did this. But I sure learned a lot about, um, especially working with forks and, and bringing things up to, up to date by rebasing them and, and all that sort of stuff, because normally the stuff that i work on is a small team like i don't i don't usually work part of the bigger code in so at red hat um, there might be a few of us collaborating on you know an active repository but the way that it normally works then is whoever is leading that repository then interacts with the company at large so the way it works out is like the consultants might have a thing that we build to help ourselves right and we all kind of collaborate on that. It's relatively small. And then someone liaises with the Red Hat engineering team to try and push that into the product, right? And so I don't, mm. I don't normally work on these like massive things. I do a pull request and I, you know, I fix up bugs here and there, but I don't do a lot of this stuff. So it was really good for me to um, talk about updating the forks and how we took a branch that was out of date. So I, I had forked the code some months ago and one of the branches was like really out of date. And so we, we updated, we pulled the 2008 branch up to snuff and we fixed things up so that we could uh, track with the origin. And we talked about making a, some good commit messages and doing good PR or pull requests. And I think that's, that's something that I've always uh, been overly verbose about because I go back and read my own logs to figure out what the heck it was that I did before. Um, yeah, I really like, I really like your style of, uh, of commit messages and stuff. Like the more <laughs> verbose and the, yeah, the better, I think. I even do that in my own personal repository because mostly this is a memory jog for me. Like what the heck did I do in this in this thing? Like, why was I changing things? So I really try yeah. and nail that down with comments in the code and, and that sort of stuff. So that's kind of what we did now. And I guess we kind of had some thoughts of where we were going to go in the future. Yeah, well, we, we were talking about uh, continuing. You know, we had a plan to continue down the, the home assistant track, but I think we're going to um, take a, a small diversion into... Um, what makes a good PR and, and how how we can make good PR pull requests as contributors, um, but also what we can look for um, if if we're a, con a contributor uh, reviewing other people's code. So um, so you know contributions to Microsoft are both pushing code, but also um, it, it helps us a huge amount. Um, when people uh, pe people in the community are reviewing other people's code, because um, we have such a strong and vibrant community, um, you know, one of the limiting factors that we have at the moment is that there's there's so much good uh, good code being um, pushed our way. Um, it actually takes us longer to to review it and make sure that it's safe and secure and working as expected. So, so the more that the community can help us with that, the better. Um, and we want to make sure that we. Um, I think this is going to be a really good resource to help people uh, to know how to do that as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's where we'll we'll head with the next video. Yeah, I think I'm I'm personally looking forward to this as as kind of one of the uh, contributing maintainers to the Home Assistant, um, the Mycroft Home Assistant section of the repository. You know, I think this is something that that will help me uh, help the Mycroft project because, like Chris said, a lot of the problem that we have is. Right now, I think there's seven or eight pull requests sitting in the um, in that branch, and we're they're holding because of testing primarily. Like I, I read through the code pretty quickly, but it's all about figuring out how to pull it down and how to test it and and work through the code uh, to make sure that it actually functions as expected. So I'm really looking forward to doing the next video with you. Yeah, yeah, and works on my machine. 
is the is the you know it's a trope in the in the dev world now like yeah. uh and we want to make sure that yeah things that we're contributing don't just work on our device but they also work on on someone else's device of the same type and someone else you know that's running a pycroft versus running a mark one versus you know all sorts of things there's so many ways that people run mycroft um and yeah uh the more help that we can get from the community in, in reviewing those things, the better. I sense yeah. a little bit of foreshadowing there. Maybe we're going to do a little bit of TDD in the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome. <laughs> that's what we try. We try for. Um, yeah. yeah well, let, let's leave that for another video. We'll, we'll have a chat about TDD, test-driven development for anyone right. that's, that's not run into that. So next time we'll meet, we'll uh, talk about PRs and, and how to work with them from all vantage points. So I'll see you next week. Awesome. See you then. Bye.